Hey guys, how's it going? AK Rex here, and I have a special guest from the United States, and I've promised you more special guests from paleontology. Dr. Jason Bork, if I'm not butchering the name, hi Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, yeah, name came out just right. It's actually better than the way it's typically pronounced here in America, so it's nice to hear the more proper pronunciation. How, how, did, they, how did they pronounce you in America? Oh, uh, in America I get borked a lot, so it's a lot of borking. I don't know, it sounds terrible when I say it that way, but so it's more B, it's pronounced like B-O-R-K-E out here, oh, okay. because they're not used to like the diphthong that you get in England, so I'm just a burk, but I'm not a bork, but that's okay. <laughs> that, that almost sounded like twerking as well. I don't presume you do any of that, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> I, it's, yeah, it depends on how much uh, alcohol I get in me. <laughs> Fair enough, I think we've all been there. In any case, well, uh, welcome to the channel. I'm glad you finally made it. Yeah, happy to be here. It's been a while. So, um, let's uh, start off just by uh, getting to know you a bit better. So, just uh, just tell us where you're from, how would you end up where you are now, how would you end up in the field, and uh, let's just hear your story. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm originally from New York. I uh, grew up in the Hudson Valley area, which to anyone outside of New York City makes you upstate New York, which is funny. But uh, yeah, I grew up there. Um, I've pretty much always had an interest in paleontology. Uh, I think it was one around maybe four years old when my mother happened to have read me a bedtime story about dinosaurs. And that's when I got the dino bug that afflicts every little kid. And I just never got over it. So after that, I just really got hooked into dinosaurs and I wanted to know everything about them. So I just really focused on that through elementary school and high school, college, pretty much on track that whole time, which was good. Um, but yeah, so then I, I just sort of worked on that. Um, I got my bachelor's of science um, in biology with a minor in geology. Uh, that was done in New Mexico. So out there, there's a lot of geology. So it's really easy to go out and just uh, go prospecting. And so that was good. Um, but I've also been on a couple field digs, some to South Dakota, where we dug up mosasaurs and plesiosaurs from uh, early Cretaceous, or no, late Cretaceous. Um, and uh, then I've done some, also done some work in Utah with some or field work there with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, did my PhD at Ohio University under uh, Larry Whitmer or Lawrence Whitmer, uh, where I um, learned uh, the importance of comparative anatomy and the and the importance of looking at the modern day animals to really get us give us a strong idea of how extinct animals were acting or how they lived, how they're how their physiology worked, how their anatomy would have worked. Um, I, and then, um, yeah, from, from there, after I got my PhD, I went off to uh, North Carolina. So I went to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where I worked with Lindsay Zano and the Zano Lab. And there I had an opportunity to do a lot of outreach work with students because uh, there's we basically have a big fishbowl at the museum there so everyone can see you working. So we encouraged people to ask questions, and then we'd bring student groups in. Um, I worked with teachers in the North Carolina region on how to incorporate paleontology and citizen science in general into a more broader aspect to sort of incorporate the public more into science or make it clear that science is really for everybody. Um, and then uh, last two years ago now, I guess, um, I, uh, what do you call it? I accepted a job as an assistant professor at the New York Institute of Technologies uh, satellite campus for their osteopathic medicine medical school um, down in Arkansas State. So now I'm in Arkansas, where I am teaching future doctors how to understand anatomy, which is pretty important. And then, the, so it's half that, and then half doing the actual research and doing the paleo, which is actually pretty standard for a lot of paleontology or a lot of paleontologists. It all works out pretty well. Um, yeah. But that's, that's pretty much how I wound up here, um, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's, that's, that sounds very... Uh, I, I like how you managed to fit pretty much your life story into literally a couple of minutes. That's, uh, that's a rare talent. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's me and my elevator pitches. <laughs>
So uh, I wanted to ask, um, just to, to get this, uh, you know, obviously cleared up. You are technically a doctor right now, aren't you? Already, because you, yes. you got your PhD, right? Yeah, I uh, got my PhD in um, 2015. So I've been a doctor for three years now, which is good. Yep. So, yep. So, so, so basically, this brings us to the next point. So uh, as, a, as a doctor and obviously now a scientist, well, can we technically say you're a junior scientist or do, do, is there no such thing as, as of... Like, you, you tell me, how does that work? Does that mean you are like a, a beginner or does that make you already a full, uh, you know, full on, you know, proper paleontologist? For the lack of better term, I get yeah. It's this is definitely one of those sort of more nebulous aspects of academia where it gets confusing. Uh, yeah, so I would definitely fall under the full fledged scientist, professional paleontologist, but I am still just a couple years out of my PhD. Um, I've got my first what we like to call adult job or big person job, which is not doing a postdoc, but actually having some kind of permanent position. Um, I have a lab now, so I'm starting to build up the lab. So all this puts me in junior scientist uh, territory or what they call an early career researcher. Uh, typically what happens with this work is you do your bachelor's and your undergrad, and you know that's just kind of the standard gets you into the door level. After that, you can do a master's, which gives you research experience and makes you more employable, or you do a PhD, or you can do a master's and PhD. And usually during the PhD process, Though it's usually focus, a lot of people focus on like what you study and what your ultimate dissertation winds up being. The real, I'd say, the real benefit of the PhD process is that it grooms you for what it's like in life as a professional in your field. So when you're doing, when you're preparing for your PhD, you're learning to do research on your own. You're presenting at conferences. You're networking with people in your field. Uh, ideally, you're getting papers published at the same time. So all of these are things that are basically stuff you're going to do after you get your PhD too, but now you've already had your feet wet with it, people recognize you from different meetings, and you have potential collaborators on future projects. So by the time you've already gotten your PhD, you've already gotten a lot of the early research ideas out of the way, or you sort of like uh, cut your teeth on how to actually do all this stuff, so now you're prepared to do stuff as a uh, career researcher. But yeah, after that, then you're just, uh, once you land a job, because uh, you'll do postdoc, you can do postdocs after that too, and that's sort of, kind of more like the PhD, except it's less guided and it gives you a chance to learn new skills that you couldn't learn with your old lab, but it also has you a chance to get more publications out, which makes you a more uh, competitive person in the field. But then once you land a job, usually an assistant professorship somewhere, that's where you have a chance to sort of settle down a little bit more and actually build out um, build out your, uh, what's you call it, your su supplies, but uh, your resources, and then actually start creating more of a lab for yourself and actually making more of a name for yourself. Though it can, it can vary, and paleontology is very uh, wibbly-wobbly with that because there are some people who will do many, many postdocs and go to many different labs and have already made an established name for themselves. It's just harder to land what might be considered a more permanent job, but at that point, it's almost uh, a formality because they've already been in the field so long, so everyone already knows them. They've done lots of collaborations. Though they would, strangely enough, still be considered an early career researcher despite having quite a back, quite an impressive portfolio already. But yeah, usually you have to have some kind of permanent gig, I guess, um, to and then have been doing it for probably 10 years or so before you're stopped considering an early career researcher. Also depends on how many grants you bring in. The more impressive your grants, the less the less likely they're going to be called an early career researcher. I'd say I probably have another ten years on me before that's going to leave. So, that so, that makes sense. <laughs> yep, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So basically, you know, until ten years elapsed, you're still going to be a, a junior. So as in, like, you're still going to be treated as the young one, regardless of your actual age, right? So that's going to make you feel younger in ten years' time, technically. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not so bad. I've never really had to deal with too much. Um, I haven't really had to deal with like getting treated differently. It depends on where you are in the field, but usually, 
find paleontology is very welcoming. So, because we we accept people from multiple different backgrounds, and including multiple educational backgrounds. So there are very well respected people who are um, self taught, and are just really great in the field, and the field is what they do. So you might not see them on a lot of publications, but you would definitely look at them as still like a professional paleontologist because they go out in the field and they find great stuff and then they help prepare it. And without you know good people in the field and good preparators, those of us who look at the stuff afterwards wouldn't have anything to look at. So very important for that too. Um, hierarchies for things like um, – like full professor versus assistant professor versus adjunct is less so in there. It really just depends on how how prolific you've ha- you've been in the field, like how how many publications you've been able to get out, or at least how much research you've been able to do, or how many specimens you're able to bring in. Very varied with uh, what what we might look at as the uh, uh, what you call it, like the uh, currency of respect in the field i guess if that makes sense absolutely yes i mean the reason why i also bring this up is because uh, we've never actually touched on a subject of the structure from the inside and uh, i kind of decided to exploit that opportunity even uh, this is actually i haven't even had that in mind before we um started this session. <laughs> hey let it go free form i like it yeah yeah, yeah i'm literally improvising because i because when you're telling me stuff i'm actually coming up with some more questions which i think would be really interesting to some of my viewers to get to know on um, how to because there are some of my viewers who are seriously considering getting into the field we've had a few yeah. brief um conversations with a few other previous guests about it from uh, dr thomas carr you know him obviously dr philip curie uh, Jeffrey was here as well. Uh, Josh was here as well. Uh, our fr- common friends, basically. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we've had some opinions from them. So we obviously want to know as many opinions of people who are involved in this as possible. So it's a great that we've touched up on that. And, oh, yeah, um, definitely. And this is a confusing aspect for, I think, a lot of people. Because I know when I was growing up, I'd say, you know, I want to be a paleontologist. And then it really wasn't until towards the end of my uh, undergraduate that I really had to ask myself, okay, one, what kind of paleontologist do I want to be? Because saying you want to be a paleontologist is like saying I want to be a scientist. It's very, very broad. And then how do I get there? And it's that how do I get there that can be very difficult for a lot of people to figure out. So anything anything I can do to help sort of clear the air on that and help give people some guidance on that, I'm happy to do. I um I think maybe it's a good idea to encourage our uh, viewers in the meantime to post the comments and see if they have any follow up questions in regards to how to get into this, so we can uh, stop yeah. them up a little bit and we can address them maybe in like volume two uh, when you whenever you get to come <laughs> back to the channel. So, sure. Uh, may, maybe if we're lucky, we could have both you and someone else as well because I've been trying to get someone else to co-host as well because it's always more fun when you have more people on there, but uh, nobody was I get available. It, yeah. <laughs> It's it, we have to deal with uh, the time differences, so it's hard to it's hard to gather everybody in one room when we're all spread around the world like this. I've done some collaborations with people in Australia and uh, and in England, and so I can definitely understand like there is finding that sweet spot where everyone's still awake. It's kind of very hard to do. Yeah, me and Josh, when we were doing a straight seven-hour uh, marathon, obviously be- people who have watched, they know that how many hours that adds up to because it's multi-part. It was split, but it was all done in one session. So every time wow. we would come back, uh, you know, uh, it would be something like, uh, you know, hello again, you know, we would just like unpause the record and be like, hello again, as if it's, uh, you know, and because it gets uploaded. It's a whole new thing. Yep. It's like a whole new thing, but it's all happened in the same, well, night, I think it was for me. For him, it was still bright daylight because he's in L.A. So yeah. So um, have you actually ever been on the field digging, or are you more of a laboratory scientist type of guy? Uh, so in general, my work is more lab based, and by lab and, and by lab based, it still means I I'll go to museums and study fossils that have already been prepared out. But I I do occasionally do some field work. Uh, again, before I entered into um, before I entered into my undergrad, I actually did. A couple of sessions in the summers um, in South Dakota, where we were digging up mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and the occasional 
hadrosaur that fell into at the time the uh, epicontinental sea that was covering that area so i've done a couple of those trips um, and then I did some work a couple years back with uh, Zano Lab, where we go out into U- or went to Utah and we were dug- and we were um, looking for and then um, digging out some uh, theropods and some uh, ornithopods that were found out there. I happened to actually be on the trip where they found the um, what was it? The nest of those theros. I think it's a therizinosaur nest, if I remember right. So I was there when uh, Terry Bucky Gates happened to cross it. And so I helped them dig that out that first year. Though at the end, they had to come back and actually airlift it out with a helicopter, which is unfortunately something I missed. But that was because they had to afford a helicopter. Turns out helicopters are really expensive. Yeah. it's a, if, if, I, if we win a lottery, we can get one for ourselves. Then we won't have to be depending on other people to hire. Yeah. That way. There are, yeah, there is a couple of well-off people in paleontology who definitely have their own, and, and like not just because they're really good at getting grants, but just sort of like they, they kind of are already well-off, and so if need be, I suspect they have the deep enough pockets to pull stuff if need be. But yeah, typically we're scrounging around for money to do some of the bigger things like rent a backhoe or rent a helicopter to do an airlift. So there is a whole um, uh, thing as well, which obviously doesn't get brought up very easily, but it's the technical aspect. Uh, like, say, for example, if you were to uh, say, OK, so I, uh, I, I wanna, I'm working on a research project. I need more evidence for something. It's not exactly, it doesn't really work like in a sense that you can just look at the menu and be like, OK, let's see. Oh, OK. So if I decide that I'm going to go for this and this and this, I'm going to go out in the field wherever it's commonly found. And I'm going to find it and bring it back. It's obviously it sounds easy, but we both know it's not. So um, what's actually involved in the, the organizing, you know, the whole process? And once you obviously find the fossil, let's say you're lucky you found that Tyrannosaurus mummy in the best case scenario, because we've been dying <laughs> for a Tyrannosaurus mummy. We want that. We wanted that for ages. Let's say we find one. And uh, w- what happens next? Like, how do you basically make sure that it gets uh, to the hands of academia if there is any way to obviously answer that you know properly it yeah it depends um so with the um uh, with the xano lab what they do ahead of time is you'll you have uh, topographic maps of the area that you're interested in that previous geological surveys have come across and that gives you an idea of roughly the time period where you'd expect outcropping of the uh of the strata that you're interested in and ideally there's also been some paleoecological work done so you can tell whether or not okay this is this is under 200 feet of ocean so we're probably not going to find a lot of dinosaurs versus this is a marshland where we have a better chance um then there is if you find a good um potential area the next thing is to see whether or not it is on private land or if it's on public land. Uh, in the United States, public land is covered by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and if not that, then you there's states um, for like state parks. There's uh, state control over some areas that are still publicly owned. And so from then you just, you petition for a, uh, you basically request a, uh, a permit to go out there and collect the specimen, any specimens that you find. And then that collection permit will vary. Some stuff only lets you collect stuff you see that's laying on top of the ground, whereas other stuff actually lets you dig down. Because digging down and digging into stuff counts as altering the terrain, it's uh, a little more difficult to get that. Um, and And when you are allowed to do that, you are required to then sort of put the dirt back when you're done, try to make it as untouched as you can. So ideally you'll get that. Uh, it can get very confusing when stuff is on private land or a mix of private land, public land, um, Native American land. It can get there are some areas in the United States where it can get very tricky, especially since you know all these animals we're interested in died at a time long before human politics came around. So you could have part of a skeleton in public land and the rest of it on some private land, or you might have a really important port part of the skeleton on this very contentious piece of land. The classic example of that, of course, is Sue the T-Rex that 
became such a huge debacle between the Sioux Nation, unrelated, and uh, whether or not it was on private land versus public land. There has now been multiple documentaries and and uh, and books on that, but it's definitely an example of just how hairy some of this stuff can get. And that's just stuff that we do in the States. Once you go into another country, things can get even more confusing. Um, the big Mongolia expeditions were, of course, a huge deal uh, because Americans had a chance, basically they had permits to go out and find uh, specimens in Mongolia and then sort of rented those Mongolian specimens for, for display and for prepping in the United States. But ultimately, all of that stuff was supposed to go back to um, Mongolia because it is their stuff. And when we follow the rules, that works really great. Obviously, both the United States, Mongolia, pretty much everywhere, um, there's the issue of private collectors who can go out and collect that stuff, uh, sometimes in less than savory means. And then there's poachers, which are neither private collectors um, nor public. They're just kind of the mercenary group that sort of goes in. They know they can sell it, so they go in and they'll take it. And it's often done in less than stellar means, so you get a lot of uh, destroying of the local environment just to get stuff out. And some of the destroying of the local environment happened long before any of us were alive, too. Like the classic example of the Bone Wars back in 1800s where everyone was just in a mad rush to, well, uh, Marsh and Cope were both in a mad rush to see who can outdo who. There was a lot of destroying each other's camps. There was a lot of use of dynamite to get stuff out as fast as possible. We try not to do any of that anymore, which is good. But uh, the poaching problem is still an issue. Uh, the question of whether or not it is in good faith to um, purchase specimens that have been collected through means that we're not sure about is always a hairy thing as well. Um, but yeah, typically if you go by the book, what you're going to do is you'll sort of do your homework first, find the most likely location, get the permits for it, hopefully find something. And if you find something, dig it out carefully. And that could be over many months, many years. Uh, some of the specimens that we looked at in Utah were in, we had gone back to that, to that site that had been looked at for three or four years before it could actually get closed up. So it just kept on producing more specimens. And then, uh, yeah, covering it up, bringing the stuff back. And then depending on what the permits say and where the permits came from, either uh, prepare it and display it or prepare it and return it to whatever country or typically country owns it. So, yeah, kind of difficult, uh, complicated work would be the right way to say it. it's pretty complicated yeah, it's definitely not an easy one. Uh, we've we've already covered a bit of poaching. Uh, Dr. Curry personally, he had to deal with a lot of it. So those of you who are not familiar and new to the channel, uh, please go back and watch my two-part interview with uh, Dr. Philip Curry to get more insight into how, you know, what sort of things can be done when poachers basically take all the valuable material um, and what sort of negative consequences it has. But Let's now move on to the, uh, uh, are you happy with this so far? We've covered Yeah, it. no, so far good. so good, yeah. Okay, awesome. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next point then. Uh, uh, let's uh, get into talking about armored dinosaurs because you've written a, and published a paper just, uh, for me, it's yesterday. For you, is it yes. still, is it yesterday for you as well? or is It, uh, it is yesterday for me as well, okay. yes. So let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Borkatal 2018. What is okay. it about and uh, what should we take away from it, uh, from the face value? And obviously we will include the link in the description box as well for those of you who want to read it because it's quite a wordy and lengthy material uh, written by uh, his it is. truly, <laughs> but very good material indeed. So let's talk about it. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, just a quick background. Um, so my work with Larry was, his work is very focused on functional morphology. So the study of anatomy, but also how that anatomy would have worked. Um, and so my contribution to that was uh, to sort of go a little bit into the realm of what we call paleophysiology. So anatomy is really um, 
where structures are and how something is connected to something else. And then physiology is really sort of anatomy and motion. So how all that would have worked. So I'm sort of was pushing down that road. Um, and my work it incorporated this engineering approach called computational fluid dynamics. So it's a, this way it's a, it's a means of using computers to simulate how fluids move. So we can do things like figure out how air uh, cross moves over cars and uh, over airplanes, so it's used a lot in aerospace. But it's also used for things like HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Try to figuring out how to get proper airflow in buildings and in houses. Basically, anything that involves the movement of fluids like air, or water, or blood, or honey, molasses, if you really want to, all that fun stuff. So that was my portion. Um, the, the paper itself is looking at the crazy airways inside ankylosaurs. So we typically, when we think of ankylosaurs, we think of them as these large armored animals, the walking tanks with uh, really armored hides that might have spikes sticking out of them. And then some of them have those large clubbed tails. Less so we think about their heads, um, in particular their noses, because for the longest time they were thought to just have your standard sort of like run-of-the-mill dinosaur nose where you got a nostril and then you got your throat, and it's pretty much a straight shot. Um, there was some work in the early 70s, late 70s, uh, Walter Coombs, among others, who was looking at the side broken skulls of these dinosaurs, and he saw that they had all these little sort of side pockets in their nasal cavity, which he thought were um, structures called paranasal sinuses. Uh, we have paranasal sinuses, so we have uh, maxillary sinus and frontal sinuses, um, along with a couple of other sinuses that for the most part, just contributes to giving us like uh, snotty noses and headaches. So I was thinking that these dinosaurs probably had something similar. It just had a lot of these extra sinuses. And it stayed that way for pretty much till about 2008 when uh, my advisor, uh, Dr. Whitmer, he and his uh, research tech, uh, Ryan Ridgely, started CT scanning some of the animals. And when they were CT scanning them, they were able to basically look inside without breaking the skull so you could see how everything is supposed to connect. And what he found was everything, all these side pockets that we thought were sinuses actually are just connections to this really long, twisted airway, which they lovingly named the crazy straw airway because it looks like the classic crazy straws that just have all the little loops in them before you get stuff out. So he found that in 2008, um, they did some preliminary work with blood vessels, and they could see that there was a lot of blood vessels running through there. And then that, le that led to the question of, okay, you have this weird nose in these dinosaurs, why do you have it? Um, and they threw out some ideas that it could have had something to do potentially with um, olfaction, so the sense of smell. Maybe it was increasing surface area for, more, for uh, the ability to smell stuff better. Uh, might have played a role in acoustic communication. Um, a long nose like that might have a chance to sort of lower the sound of the sound waves coming out, sort of giving them a more baritone sound. Um, and then it could also have had something to do with thermoregulation because you have all these blood vessels running through there and you have this crazy airway which has a lot of surface area in it, so there's a lot of potential for heat to transfer from the blood into the air. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that all three of these scenarios are uh, hypothetical. Right? It's like this could be it. The dinosaurs, though, are long dead, so they are not breathing anymore, so we can't really test it. Um, they don't have any of the soft tissue that would have like preserved the epithelium, so we could then see whether or not there's olfactory epithelium or this respiratory epithelium. So it was kind of just sort of left in a lurch. It's like, okay, these are potential options that these dinosaurs could have been doing, but we don't really know. And it stayed that way for, it's kind of fitting that it's 2018, because for about 10 years. Um, but then, yeah, when I came on board uh, as Larry's student, and we were looking at some options for what we can do with this these computational approaches and what kind of questions we could broach, uh, the ankylosaurus came up again because they had this weird nose. And so what I decided to do was we were going to take the CT scans they originally had, um, clean up their reconstructions of the nose a bit and incorporate what we know about modern animals and then actually simulate the movement of air through the nose at some kind of given temperature and just see, okay, if it, if it works in thermoregulation, let's see just how well it works. And then we can compare it to modern day animals and see how, how that compares to say like a modern horse or a giraffe would do. So that's what I did. Uh, we ran the 
analysis on our on the computers in the lab. Um, it took quite a while to get things working right because there's a lot of assumptions always associated with computational approaches, and we tried to limit how many times we have to make assumptions about things. Um, and then we ran the analysis, and when we got done, we compared our results, and what we found was that uh, both of the dinosaurs were able to warm up their incoming air uh, very effectively, um, almost up to body temperature for one animal and then all the way up to body temperature for another. And then when they were breathing back out, they were able to – one second. Um, uh, yeah, I quickly wanted to ask uh, which animals exactly were used. Uh, was it not yes, Panop yes. Pan Panoplosaurus and Euplocephalus, right? Right. Yes. So uh, we looked at two. Sorry, I should I should con uh, comment more on that. Yes. So we looked at two um, ankylosaurs. So the group itself, Ankylosauria, is actually pretty broad. Um, and early on in that group, they kind of there was a sort of basal split. Um, one group, the Nodosaurids, sort of went their own way. They had these long horse-shaped heads, um, but they were more spiky. So they had large spikes coming off the shoulders area, but they didn't have a clubbed tail. Then there are the ankylosaurids, which were the other group, and they grew um, – they had more of a boxy-shaped head. They were less spiky, but they still had some spikes. Um, and then, of course, they had the classic clubbed tail. So two, two different divisions of this same sort of walking tank look. Um, so we had skulls from Panoplosaurus and skulls from Euoplocephalus, which are two pretty well-known examples in that group. So we took those, and those were the ones that were scanned back in 2008, and they both had these crazy loops inside their nose. Uh, Panoplosaurus had a less complicated-looking nose than Euoplocephalus. Um, but, and then when we ran the analysis to see which, how well each of them did at heat transfer, what we did see is that the more complicated nose of Euoplocephalus was able to pull more heat out of the blood and into the air and then bring that stuff back in when they were breathing out than Panoplosaurus was. So that was cool. Uh, we compared it to modern day animals and we actually found that if we look at, say, animals ranging from um, horses and giraffes to kangaroo rats and uh, pigeons and crows, uh, there's a little desert iguana in there too. We throw them in there, the dinosaurs pretty much get lost in the mix. Like they all fall roughly in line with what we'd expect for modern animals today. So pretty remarkably efficient airways. Euoplocephalus was a little better than Panoplosaurus, which is interesting. So in all the scenarios we tested, it usually did better. Um, and then we decided to do these, uh, what we call uh, secondary analyses because we were looking at digital models, which meant that we could do things that you can't really do with the with the real skulls. We were able to break and rearrange the nose, which let us test some alternate scenarios. So one of them is that okay, these animals have these really long and complicated airways, and that's what's letting this heat transfer take place. Well, what if we got rid of the complication, didn't make it loop so much, or what if we didn't make it a long nose and made it a short nose, like? you would think based on their skulls and we ran those analyses and what we saw is that the animals were actually that 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 having a long and complicated nose was indeed the important part of it because when you make the nose short there's not enough time for this heat transfer to take place and so these animals wind up losing a lot of heat or they're not heating up the air well enough and if you get rid of the twists and turns aside from the fact that a nose that long isn't going to fit in their skull it also reduces that heat transfer ability too so Having a nose that's really long and having it coiled around inside the skull was actually really important for getting this effective heat transfer to take place. Of course, these animals were living in uh, Canada at the time, so they were living in Alberta. They're both from the Dinosaur Park Formation, which was uh, Campanian, so like late Cretaceous, 73-ish million years ago, if I remember right, or maybe 75. But uh, it was not exactly a cold time. Like now, Alberta, Canada, you definitely associate with pretty cold temperatures. But back then, uh, isotope analysis indicates that it had a mean annual temperature closer to about 15 degrees Celsius, which is pretty cozy warm because um, you know it means your hotter temperatures are going to be really hot and your colder temperature not going to be that much colder. And they were living in marshlands, so it was probably pretty hot and wet. Um, and they were both living at the same time, which is also interesting, and in the same place. 
So this gave us a unique opportunity because we're looking at animals that should theoretically be in under similar selective pressure uh, because they're living in that same environment and at the same time. But one of them, it seems to be doing this heat transfer better than the other. And so we started asking, okay, well, why would, say, euoplocephalus be so much better at pulling heat out of the air or pulling heat out of the blood? And what, one of our uh, hypotheses is that it's just because euoplocephalus was a, was a little bit bigger. Um, I think it's like, let me think. Maybe mass-wise overall would be a nice uh, indication, or I don't know what even would be the yeah, better. So, yeah, based off mass. So based off length, they're about the same. But estimated mass, which, and that's always a tough one because we're talking about things like what's what does larger actually mean? What is large What when we talk about size? Yeah, context uh, is very difficult to define here, isn't it? It is. Uh, typically when I talk about things like size, I try to focus more on mass because you can have two people that are the same height, but one person could be a lot bulkier than the other. And so we generally would think that the person who's bulkier is going to be the bigger person. Similarly, with these animals, even though Euoplocephalus and Panoplosaurus were both close in size with length, or close in length to each other, Panopl or Euoplocephalus was much more barrel-chested and just had a squatter, sort of sturdier body to it, which is why it was about, I think, one around one and a half times the size, based on our estimate, or one and a half times the weight, I guess you could say. So, um, and comparing to modern animals, it's uh, our comparison goes, uh, Panoplosaurus is about the size of a hippo, so around uh, one and a one to, well, actually, yeah, like about one ton. And then Euoplocephalus was more like a rhinoceros, so about one and a half tons or so. So bigger animal, uh, bigger animals produce a lot. Or this is okay. So then we get into the whole physics of the matter. It's like okay, so yeah, the bigger animal. Okay, so if it's bigger, why is having that heat transfer so much more important? Um, and we run into this physical thing uh, called uh, well, it's, it's it's a result of scaling. So basically larger animals, larger anything, uh, the bigger something gets, typically the uh, less surface area it has around it um, and the larger its internal volume is. And so heat ultimately moves via conduction. So it has to go from cell to cell to air. And the more cells you have before you can reach the air, the longer it's going to take that heat to both get into the body and get out. So larger animals in general tend to retain heat a lot easier. They hold stable temperatures than smaller animals, which can change temperatures very quickly because they just really have a high surface area on them, uh, which is typically why you see like you can have an elephant out in the snows of, uh, in like Minnesota, and they can stay out there for a couple of weeks without having any ill effects just because their bodies are so used to holding or so good at holding in all that heat. Uh, but then the downside is if you're a really big animal and you're living in a hot environment, you're going to run into trouble where you're going to overheat because now you have all the, you have this body that's just absorbing heat from the outside, producing heat through metabolic processes. And then in the case of these dinosaurs, because they're herbivores that probably used hind gut fermentation, they're also producing heat in their gut just from all this rotting vegetation. So it's kind of this triple whammy where it's just hitting them all over. But we see in modern animals like elephants that live in the savanna that they that in the daytime they just get bombarded with all this heat and their body just stores it. And then overnight they do this vasodilation. They push their blood they really open up all the blood vessels in their skin and really just start radiating all this heat out overnight. So large animals have found ways around around this, but they still run into issues where you can suffer heat stroke several hours after like the sun goes down. This is a problem that has been recorded in some of the large um, Aldabra tortoises that live on the Aldabra Atoll, so the animals out there, where they can, they'll, they'll, you'll have spec or a specimen that'll be out there eating or like grazing on grass for a couple of hours in the heat and seemingly okay, and then it'll go overcast or it'll go into the shade, and then several hours later it will die from heat stroke because its body has absorbed so much heat and had just not had a chance to dump all that heat. So any means to sort of 
cool that down would be good. Um, in this case, the head can only do so much because the head is pretty small compared to the rest of the body. But heads um, also contain very important structures on them. In particular, it has the brain, which is that sort of big switching station for the whole body. And brains being neural structures, uh, from what we know of modern animals, neural structures really don't like it when you change temperature fast and really don't like it when they get very hot. So if you have this body that's just taking in all this heat and producing all this hot blood and it's going to send that hot blood up to the brain because the brain needs nutrients then and in the particular if you're a dinosaur you have a pretty small brain then you have this brain that's going to transfer heat pretty quickly and so for the case of these dinosaurs basically the act of uh being alive was almost putting their brains at in jeopardy of boiling over just from just being so big so the upshot is um, work by my colleague Ruger Porter, who did the vessel reconstructions in these dinosaurs, showed that the veins coming from the nose were actually heading back straight to the brain. So you'd have all this hot blood going into the nose from the arteries, and it's going to get cooled off as the animal breathes in because that heat's going to transfer into the air. And then that cool blood goes to the veins, which then transfer into the head or into the into the brain. And basically cover the brain in this thick, uh, not thick, but cover the brain in this sort of coolant fluid, sort of similar to how like cars work. And so that helps to offset the heat coming from the body. Um, and so that was kind of a big deal. And we suspect that the reason the Euoplocephalus just shows this sort of better heat transfer is because as a larger animal, it was going to be having higher heat loads to deal with. Um, it's also, po it is also, um, even likely that the different lifestyles of the animals was probably playing a role in it too, because the head shapes between the two um, ankylosaurs suggest they both were eating slightly different foods, which means they were probably living in different micro environments in the general area uh, with Euoplocephalus being more of a generalist grazer. Um, and what we know from modern day animals that do grazing is that they don't, they'll get, crappy food from wherever but they eat so much of it that it offsets it but when you eat crappy food from wherever it also means you're probably doing stuff like spending more time in the sun in the open whereas if you're more picky you might be in a more forested area where you have to worry less about dealing with excess heat that's a tougher one to say for certain but i suspect it's, it's probably a mix of lifestyle and size that was ultimately driving the more efficient noses in these guys so just to insert quickly here, it's uh, yeah. it, it's almost like an equivalent of modern day uh, kind of, you know, eating in McDonald's sort of thing to dumb it down a little bit, <laughs> or is that not <laughs> quite as bad as that yet? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, definitely hotter at McDonald's. Yeah, uh, in, if you're a generalist um, and you're a large animal and you're an herbivore, then yeah, it would be kind of like eating a lot of McDonald's food. Um, sort of it's so when we say bad food for uh, animals usually we're talking about food that has low nutritional value and you know to be fair McDonald's food isn't exactly like boasting a lot of high nutritional value but it does have a lot of calories to it which is why it's generally not a good idea to eat a whole lot of McDonald's but uh, this is more like eating a it's almost like living off of things like celery and asparagus oh, yeah. or broccoli. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're technically considered to be good for you, but uh, you would need a lot more of them in volume and sheer size and portions just to be able to actually satisfy your um, the, well needs, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, like it's, it's really hard to live off of that kind of food because especially things like celery where it takes more energy to actually pull the nutrients out that you get than what you get back. So... It's okay if you're really big, though. You can eat things like grasses, um, not so much for the dinosaurs because grass was kind of fewer and further between. But you can eat basically low-quality vegetation that's really hard to pull stuff out. But just like buying things in bulk, you can get a discount if you, if you buy enough of it. So in this case, if they eat enough food, it offsets it and it balances out in the long run. But you got to eat a whole lot of it. So you spend a lot of time just eating low quality food to just keep yourself running so Whereas basically picky, uh, this means that from understanding of how their um how this system of heat exchange uh, plus the breathing uh, or 
t technique, I guess, behind, uh, the, you know, from this anatomy analysis that tells us a lot about how uh, they were spending their time, more or less. It gives us an indication uh, of uh, their lifestyles as much as it does just... So we're basically not just looking at the physical, you know, whatever it is that we see f at the face value, but we're actually able to make a lot of very interesting hypotheses just uh, branching off that idea alone. Yeah, it, it, it provides a uh, an avenue of ev or like a line of evidence that can help s that supports a hypothesis about their lifestyle. Um, it is a hypothesis that other people have looked at before, again, based off the shape of their snouts and sort of like their teeth and how well that would work. So it offers some clue as to what they might have been doing when they were alive. Um, but yeah, so it's it's kind of nice to sort of take the data and then sort of sort of go to the next step. Uh, the trick is not to go too far beyond the data, which is always a tough thing to do in paleontology. It must be quite tempting to do that sometimes, I'm pretty sure. It, it, it yeah, it, it is. There's there's no shortage of rampant speculation, uh, you, especially if you go to the meetings. But that's fine because that's when everyone's just sort of brainstorming ideas anyway. Uh, as long as it doesn't usually make it to print, it's not that big a deal. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, we we, we the reason why I brought this up is because we have a lot of um, uh, people in the community, as in like not the we're not talking about professionals, but we're talking about more so the follower, the following base, and. Um, they tend to obviously over sensationalize. Uh, oh my God, words are parasites sometimes. Over, <laughs> over sensationalize um, a certain aspect of uh, uh, prehistoric animals just based off a word of mouth and uh, just because it might, you know, ring a bell somewhere and just correlate with something that they just thought would have been cool if it were true. And um, the funny part is that uh, I think we're both we both can be honest here. We, I mean, we're all about intellectual honesty here, right? So we can ad admit that we have had those ideas of ourselves, but oh, yeah. uh, we, we just don't have the proof. So therefore we don't make the claim, but we do sometimes like to discuss them from time to time. Yeah, it's like, it would be cool if this is what happened, but we can't really say. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, obviously, the, the difference between um, uh, Euplocephalus and um, Panoplosaurus uh, yeah. In this context, does this tell us anything about how well were they able to detect the potential predator? Because being an armored creature, um, especially uh, in this uh, context where you have, uh, you would have a Tyrannosaurid kind of predators as well. Because so far, this is very interesting that all yeah. of these heavily armored dinosaurs coexisted with one type or another of a Tyrannosaurid, which seems to show more uh, adaptation as the time goes on. Uh, to be better equipped to deal with armored prey. It doesn't mean that they would be their top priority prey, but it means that they would have that option if everything else fails. So what I mean to ask is how would they be able to kind of uh, get themselves around this issue? Would they be likely to see them, uh, more likely see them or more likely smell them? Or would they not be able to do either of these things and thus expose themselves potentially to the attack? If there is any way to test this, of course. Yeah, um, we can look at in the in the nasal cavity. Um, so the the nose itself, we usually associate it with smell, like sense of smell. But that portion, that's just like a portion of what the nose can do and what it sort of what its uh, functions are. And it's usually a pretty small region of the nose that's dedicated to that. I mean, it can be very expanded, like we see in dogs, but Compared to the rest of the airway, it's usually pretty small, and that's because the rest of the airway is usually doing more of this heat transfer stuff. But because of that, we can usually get a pretty good idea of what the overall size of that olfactory recess would be, so that area where they really take in smells and analyze it. Um, uh, a uh, One of our colleagues, uh, Tetsudo Miyashida, in 2011, if I remember right, uh, looked at the skull of Euoplocephalus and really analyzed it to see how how much of that space would have been taken up by olfactory epithelium, so how much of that nasal cavity would have been devoted to smell. And what he found was that they, it was pretty much a standard dinosaur level of uh, olfactory recess. It wasn't particularly expanded. 
it was about the same what you get in a ceratopsian or stegosaurid or um not so much sauropods sauropods kind of seem a little less but they're their own weird thing but basically they had kind of like your your standard issue dinosaur sense of smell so it doesn't show signs of really being expanded much uh, it would still have been pretty good um, and they probably would have used it to sniff out predators but it also probably was helping find other things too uh, it wasn't i wouldn't say that whether or not it was it doesn't look like it was their primary sense um, it's hard to say what their primary sense would be kind of looks like they were kind of well distributed among the five senses or at least the five that we can the four the five that we can see um their eyesight no one's really looked too much into their eyesight uh in part because things like the optic tectum and the no and the and the brain are kind of hard to distinguish um the olfactory region is a little easier because there's usually these bulbs the olfactory bulbs which if you ever look at uh endocasts of dinosaurs or of reptiles in general you usually see these like stalks sticking out coming off the brain that's usually where the olfactory region is um and so yeah it's if they were look if they saw a predator um or if a predator was nearby i suspect that they it would probably be a mix of sight and smell and then depending on how loud the predator is there might even be some hearing involved too though if we use modern armored animals um, as any kind of analog i suspect they also probably the big adults at least probably didn't care much yeah i can agree with that as well because uh, this uh, this is not where we actually just look at the obviously just to give the viewers a bit of a distinction here we're not looking at the comparison to modern animal animals from the phylogenetic relationship point of view but more so from the physical you know niche point of view or right. how they would relate to their respective ecosystem which means they would just as well just as likely be exposed to the potential predation as uh, we're talking about these um, ankylosauria animals as well because we're just all, all we're doing basically is when we're looking at dinosaur equivalents we're just upping the game in size scale pretty much that's what it means i would imagine to just to kind of keep it simple for that purpose i would say that's probably what we're looking at here yeah, yeah. In this case, it's just animals that are roughly doing the same thing, even though they don't have the same evolutionary toolkit. So, everyone's like an armadillo looks quite a bit different from an ankylosaur and is pretty far removed from it, but is also pretty armored. And armored animals tend to care less about what other animals think of them. I mostly get this from many, many videos online of turtles just walking amongst potential predators and not caring at all and just sort of pushing their way through in some cases doing questionably qu using questionable judgment such as uh red-eared sliders that are just like bugging alligators even though alligators eat sliders so i don't know just something about being armored where you just stop caring yeah you get overconfident i guess I mean, I know I would be, but uh, provided that if I lived, you know, to survive the experience of somebody potentially getting to me, I'd probably be a bit less confident after that one. <laughs> yeah. And once you're an adult, I mean, for most animals, once you're an adult, you're pretty, well, for most large animals, once you're an adult, you're usually pretty safe until this you get old. This is another interesting thing. Maybe, um, uh, is there uh, any evidence to tell us uh, how, um, uh, you know, you you mentioned obviously we are talking about adult animals, but uh, the skulls you were looking at, would you say they were adult skulls, young adults, or relatively young specimens overall? Is there any way? Um, you, have you actually considered the age as a uh, you know factor in to decide to see whether or not this could have affected this developmental process, or was that not really the primary objective at this point in time yet? Uh, yeah, the primary objective was certainly just sort of seeing how well our current understanding of the nose worked. Um, the animals we looked at would have been adults, uh, whether or not they'd fall under that sub-adult, young adult category is harder to say. Uh, one thing that makes ankylosaurs confusing is a lot of the structures that you would look for, like sutures fusing in the skull, all gets wiped away because of all this sort of dermal ossification that happens. They basically just, they took, they took their skulls and then they put a helmet of bone on top of it and fuse it all together so it just covers over all those sutures so it gets a little harder to tell when you have an adult animal um, in terms of like cessation of growth rate 
for these animals, they're definitely some of the largest representatives of their species. So we're pretty certain we're at least in a, the sub-adult range, like late sub-adult, pretty close to fully grown. They could also be completely grown adults. It's hard to say for certain. I would love to look at younger animals and see if they have a miniature version of the noses of the adults. Um, the other thing we're interested in is uh, earlier representatives in the group. Um, there's a, the smallest ankylosaur known as uh, Canbarasaurus. From Australia, um, isn't it? From Australia. Uh, there's also Minmi, but Canbarasaurus and Minmi are kind of close enough to be the same animal. Minmi itself is kind of known by not much stuff anyway. So in general, when we think about that that small ankylosaur in Australia, now we think Canbarasaurus. But it's small. It's not an ankylosaur, and it's not a notosaur. It's somewhere at the base before the split, maybe. How, um, it also um, has a weird nose. How uh, how much? Uh, sorry to be kind of bulging it, but just to get a bit no, of no, an idea. Fine. Uh, how uh, much roughly of the time difference between the periods we're talking about between the dinosaur park and whatever respective uh, period the Combarosaurus came from? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. Well, that if we can is a that. let's do a quick look thing. Um, yeah, so this is. Where was Dinos this guy Dinosaur found? Park, we're talking about like 74 something, maybe 75 million years ago, I presume. About Yeah, about that time. And it was a, found in Rich, or found in Queensland. Uh, I'm just trying to get, there we go. It is, Al, so yeah, so Albion Age, which is about, uh, maybe about 113 million years ago. It's quite a difference, isn't it? It is. It's quite a difference. So it definitely would have been a younger, or sorry, younger, an older time period. So um, earlier branching time period for ankylosaurs in general. Smaller animal, uh, lived at a different time and a different place, but would have sort of had that original toolkit that all those ankylosaurs would have been using anyway. And we looked at, and the, the, there has been a study done a couple years back, uh, also by Dr. Whitmer and co and colleagues, where they did look inside the skull of Cabarasaurus, and they did show that it uh, has a much simpler nose than what we see in both Panoplosaurus and Euoplocephalus. Whether or not that's the sort of starting point nose for all ankylosaurids, or if it's because this guy's just particularly small and living in a different region, that's where it gets harder to tell. That's yeah. where it's hard to tease those things out. So uh, another question I had uh, in regards to yeah. this is whether or not you're uh, obviously considering uh, to, because you did say that Combarasaurus would be an interesting one, but how much further do you think would be a good idea, uh, you know, for the purpose of expanding this research uh, to expand the data set? Say, for example, would you look at the whole uh, uh, major, you know, umbrella family of Therapleurans? Sorry, I'm butchering the name again. Or would you be looking at the more narrowed Ankylosauria as uh, its own thing? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of expanding the data set for the research? Uh, it's interesting because um, one thing that we wanted to point out in the paper uh, happens towards the end is that this weird, expanded, complicated nose and Ankylosaurs is not unique to them among dinosaurs. So the hadrosaurs also have this really expanded nose made most prominent in the crested lambiosaurids, so like um, Parasaurolophus and Carithosaurus. All these guys have these like very ornamental looking crests have even really crazier looking airways inside those crests. Um, sauropods, so like Brachiosaurus has that classic sort of head crest going on. But that head crest is more of just an enlarged nasal passage. So sauropods show this expansion of the nose. Um, ceratopsians, of course, have that giant air spot for their nose to go. So there's an expansion in ceratopsians as well. All, we're seeing all these large dinosaurs that are showing this some kind of expansion in the nose in one way or another. Uh, we suspect it has something to do with heat transfer. Um, we're... It's harder in a lot of those other animals to reconstruct the nose because it's not as well preserved. Um, in the case of sauropods, usually there's not even any kind of roof to go by, so the sky's the limit on how far the nose went out. 
And that's where all these crazy uh, uh, re reconstructions we've had from in the realms of, I don't know, I'm trying to give a good example, but you know, like the uh, Brachiosaurus with trunks and all of that kind of nonsense. Right, which, right, which yes. I, which I think has been debunked a long time ago, but uh, yeah, just to give you guys who are watching a bit of a nightmare before you go to bed, in case it's, you know. <laughs> it's worth looking up, it is something else. Um, but yeah, stuff like that where we can tell that the nose was expanded, but it's harder to say for certain what it would have looked like. But it's interesting that we see this correlation with large body size and weird noses. And if we look back at earlier representatives in the group, back before they all got really big, because each one, interestingly enough, gets big independently, uh, the smaller versions, the earlier versions, like Protoceratops for Ceratopsians, uh, Skeletosaurus for a lot of the Thyreophorans. Um, Thyreophorans, is that what you, how you uh, say that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, Thyreophora, Thyreophora, whichever. Thyreophora, right, okay. Why, why did I even... I, I called them something completely different. Uh, so no, I, yeah. no worries. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, basically, if you, you find these early versions um, where the dinosaurs are still pretty small and their noses are all pretty, like, I'm calling it like the standard issue, kind of classic, easy nose, like simple trek from nose to throat. It's not until you get above somewhere around a t an estimate of around a ton or more where the nose starts to get a lot more complicated. So again, that suggests that it's probably being that the, the the pressure seems to be coming from uh, dealing with just being a bigger animal. And being a bigger animal just causes all kinds of fun problems that dinosaurs were remarkably good at solving. So basically, another, uh, another observation to note, uh, correct me, of course, if I'm wrong, uh, that uh, this um, whole... Uh, uh, relationship between uh, the nasal structures uh, and um, the size uh, seems to be consistent throughout all the animals. So as they grow bigger, we see it consistently in all of them, pretty much. Because you said it yourself already that it's uh, not particularly unique, it's actually quite widespread. So I kind of... Yes. There are two exceptions to this. Okay, yeah, well, um, that's an interesting point, so let's and get... The, and the exceptions, are, the exceptions are always cool, because the exception... Because if you're going to be the exception to the rule, then that means you have to have, have be doing something different. Uh, stegosaurs got pretty big. And as far as we can tell, they didn't really seem to expand their nose much. Hard to, hard to say for certain because I've not seen a whole lot of CT scans of it. But in general, it looks like a stegosaur nose and like a, like a Toyjangosaurus or a Kentrosaurus they all kind of have the same look and nose despite being vastly different in size with of course stegosaurus being just a monster in size so they're weird and then the theropods also weird obviously we got some really large theropods estimates for sue the t-rex come in just shy of 10 tons now which is like crazy big um but it has a nose that is not that different from at least on the outset, doesn't look that much different from Allosaurus or from Centarsus, or not Centarsus now, but um, or Dilophosaurus or even Velociraptor. So they did not show as much of this big expansion in the nose, but they obviously got really big and would have had to deal with heat loads, so they had to have been getting rid of that heat somehow. And so that leads us to questions of what else can you do to dump that heat? Um, and there's some there's some ideas out there for the theropods. As far as I know, no one really has a clue yet with stegosaurs. They're a sadly understudied group. Yeah, we are lucky for us here in London. We've got a, one of the most well-preserved stegosaurus stenops uh, specimens. That's right in the you know in the center of the back entrance to the museum here in London. You would nice. you, you would definitely know which specimen I'm talking about. It's nicknamed Sophie. So yes. Uh, you also have some of the best stegosaurus researchers there too, so yep. all the better. Yep, that's that, that, that's very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's interesting you brought up as well uh, the um, uh, Tyrannosaurus. Uh, so we, I mean, uh, I, I I hardly keep up with these uh, recent. Uh, what according to I don't know what source, but uh, what source was it uh, that gave them as much as ten tons, or was it just simply something that was brought up there and then during discussions? Oh, it's, um, let me see if I grab it. It was John Hutchinson's paper, I think had the latest, um, what do you call it? Um, the latest 
estimate for body size. Uh, I think it was their 2011 study. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, that rings a bell. Yeah, it's because I remember that Hutchison gave it quite a big, um, Hutch, Hutchinson actually, uh, gave him, um, gave it quite a big uh, estimate, but I was always kind of struggling to put it, put my head around exactly the numbers. But yeah, I heard that it was quite big. And, yeah, uh, I'm trying to see. Yeah, their minimum mass for Sue was about nine tons. Their maximum mass was 18 tons. Well, <laughs> which, to be fair, and where and, do you uh, put it? <laughs> that's what Dr. Hutchinson put in there. Is like this is like, this is the most portly Tyrannosaurus you'd ever see. So very, and, and they said the high end mass ranges are less likely compared to the lower end mass ranges, and that's pretty standard. With any of these computational models, I don't, I'm not. It's just it's something to do with the way computers work. Your yeah. high end is always closer to fantasy land than your low end because low end is being more conservative the low end, the high end is just being very liberal with stuff in this case it's stuffing as much tissue as you can on that skeleton i think that if i remember right a 18 ton sue uh had its legs like both legs were pretty much just flowing into each other at that point yeah that would be insane that's like bodybuilder you know and level stuff <laughs> That's that's Sue eating too many cakes. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, uh, maybe too many cakes. Actually, okay, let's just be real here. Too many cakes. Yeah, that that would be. I mean, and and you can see there are some videos online of what like a really fat crocodile looks like. It's always sad, but oh, uh, yeah, crazy. Can, yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, they, they they sometimes they can get chevy, but yeah, I mean, eighteen tons is probably not going to be a thing. But nine, I think, is nine point five was the nine and a half tons was their minimum on that, and that's. You know, and to be fair, Sue is giant. Like, among the Tyrannosaurus, among the Tyrannosaurus specimens we have, Sue is definitely on the higher end compared to the others. So, it's not surprising that she'd be, or it would be, as big as it was. It would be interesting to know more of other specimens, though, because there are some like Scotty, for example, uh, and there are quite a few others like Tricks that, according at least to the you know, whatever source is available, they claim that they reach that size, and Scotty even being somewhat more robust, despite liking like a half a meter or something, you know, in length. Just oh yes, right. To, so there's like there's this kind of flowing around them. So there's it seems like they even out at that size. So that's a cap, but um, it would be interesting to know what would they get out of that. Yeah, and it is important um, to for people to keep in mind that uh, fossilization is extremely rare. So because of that, we're very, it's very unlikely that we're going to get the biggest, the most outliers, because you think of the biggest person who ever lived, um, the, like the largest person who ever lived, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was, I think he stood about, I thought he was about a little shy of 12 feet tall. Oh my goodness. He was huge. Yeah, uh, he that's like suffered from heart problems. And or even look at like um, Andre the Giant, who was over eight feet. Like these are we're talking like a handful of people. And when we look at the kind of and we look at the fossilization pro process, it's not going to be that handful of outliers that you're going to have preserved. Even though the fo even though fossils tend to or fossilization tends to skew towards bigger animals just because they're larger, have a better chance of getting preserved. The just the fact that it's so rare makes it very unlikely that you're going to get the biggest of the big. So Sue is big, Scotty is big. We're looking at just again, like if they were if Sue's around maybe nine ish ton tons, maybe T Rex topped out at like twelve tons. There might have been one or two individuals who were just just huge monsters among Tyrannosaurus, which is already a huge monster, so to speak. Um, we just but don't know, that, unfortunately. That, yeah, but uh, that like twelve footer, like or that that twelve ton animal is not going to is very unlikely to survive. So you're going to get what we call high end normal. So still a normal distribution of animals that are going to get preserved, but because of the size difference, they're going to be skewing towards the higher end versus the smaller ends. Yeah. So well, yeah, yeah T-Rex get pretty big. They they do get pretty big. Yeah, we we also have to take into account that there's so many other 
uh, interesting theropods, but we're, we're, we're drifting oh, from theropods. It seems it's almost interesting. Theropods, this, they have this tendency that they always take over every single conversation. Even if you start with something like, let's talk Theratopsians, let's talk Ankylosaurus, and then we just end up talking about T-Rex every single time. It's, it is. Uh, it's, it, it has it's this a hard thing, thing to rein it? in. It's, and, and it's, and it, you know, you, you leave... You leave dinosaurs and you you go and you look at all the animals that people are really into that are alive today. And it's always the big carnivores, like the lions and tigers and bears and wolves, um, interested in crocodiles and alligators, less so in like turtles and rhinos. Um, People like elephants, but uh, deer, things like that. If you're not, and, and I suspect, and this is where you sort of get into little hand wavy territory but i suspect it has to do with just the animals that eat you are naturally going to be more interesting to you mostly so they don't so you know how to not get eaten by them yep. so we just tend to go down that road and of course theropods were eating all those dinosaurs so we get really interested in the big toothy guys and then i don't know there's just something about humanity where we just really love to hear about the biggest and baddest right everyone loves to talk about great white sharks uh, less people like to talk about tiger sharks and bull sharks, even though both of those are more likely to eat you than a great white would. Yep, that's true. Um, and then no one talks about like reef sharks or sand tigers or angelfish, which are or angel sharks, which are just weird looking. So yeah, it's always the biggest and the baddest that grab our attention. And I, I like the hammerheads personally. I think they're cool. Hammerheads are awesome. Yep. Uh, I would love to have a chance to go swimming with a hammerhead. Extremely skittish, but it'll be worth trying. I was gonna, um, I was gonna say that when it comes to T-Rex, uh, eating is probably come around. Obviously, we we will touch in the pop culture in a second part of this interview. But yeah, uh, when you said like they were eating all these things, I was gonna add that lawyers might have, according to Jurassic Park, been part of the diet. Occasional lawyer getting. Uh... Occasional okay, lawyer yeah. stepping through the time portal, maybe you know, and then we somehow in the fossils we will, we might have you know like a fossilized you know business card with a suit there <laughs> that is a good quality business card to survive the digestive yep. system of a tyrannosaur it must, it must be it must be but we don't have the evidence unfortunately so like i said we like to talk about how cool things can be cool but we don't have the evidence to prove it so right it's cool we just gotta keep our inferences in check which is important exactly. it's easy to just sort of go Go on a rant and lose track of things. I wanted to uh, bring up another point about the paper itself. So, um, see the other thing I, I was curious about. You brought up the hadrosaur, lambiosaur, and hadrosaurids. And um, yeah, one of the interesting things we know about Parasaurolophus specifically, of how uh, they were able to produce this very interesting sounds. You know, and um, is this something that was noted in uh, your analysis with, in regards to these two ankylosaur specimens and uh, have they produced any anything particularly significant? Anything they can tell us whether or not what kind of sounds could they do if they were even out there communicating by means of sounds at all? Yeah, that's always a tough one. Um, I'm just, uh, I've past couple of years I've been working uh, with the uh, Xana Lab um, and the Whitmer Lab on and actually the Evans Lab, um, can't forget them, in Toronto. Um, we're trying to work on sound production in lambiosaurs. It is a tough thing. It's a tough nut to crack because sound is sound waves are harder to, um, to simulate just because they take up a, a lot more computational time. But we are looking into doing that. Um, obviously, the classic example of the sound that comes from Parasaurolophus was actually done in the 80s by uh, Dave Weissample, where he put together PVC pipes and just blew through it, which worked out remarkably well. More, uh, more detailed computational work was done in the late 90s to sort of come to the same-ish conclusion. And the important thing is the sounds that, that, we he- that you often associate with Parasaurolophus would just be almost like the sounds or it would basically be the sounds that you would get by just blowing the air very fast or powerfully through the nose versus blowing it through at a specific sound, like making a sound through the nose and seeing what happens. So there's limits on that. Um, and that's the thing that we're trying to deal with now because the thing that usually is responsible for changing sound waves, um, 
the syrinx and birds, the larynx and crocodiles and various lizards and humans, that doesn't fossilize. And so it's harder to grasp exactly what kind of what the, what the potential ranges would be. Um, there are some ways around it that we've been able to deal with, though. Um, the fact that the animals are large comes in handy because large animals always tend to skew towards the uh, lower end of the sound frequency spectrum. Um, and that has a lot to do with the size of the ears um, and the size of the ear bones that actually help transmit that sound. So the larger the ear bones get, the less high frequency sounds can get transferred through it. So the more push it takes from sound waves to actually get it to move. So animals tend to skew towards a lower frequency as they get larger. Uh, if we look at just the animals closest related to dinosaurs, so we look at birds, we look at crocs, we expand it out a bit, we can look at uh, lizards and even turtles. And what we see is that whole group tends to be more, t tends to live more in the low frequency level of like lower frequency sounds and even infrasonic sounds than they do in a higher frequency. So it's very likely then um, based on the anatomy of what we know about dinosaur ears and the size of many dinosaurs and then their closest relatives that they would have all skewed towards listening to lower frequency sounds, which means they also were probably producing low frequency sounds. And then we can do things like look at the inner ears of dinosaurs and actually see uh, the shape of the structure that's responsible for understanding sound, a structure called the cochlea. We can actually get a rough idea of what frequency of sound that cochlea was likely so to hear. So it's, like a bit, it's a bit like you're going uh, by reversing the process. So you know what sort of things they can perceive and then you just kind of do the negative or positive from the negative impression and transfer it to the other side pretty much. It's not what it is basically. Yeah, it's it's uh, a bit of reverse engineering. We, we see what what their brains could most likely interpret and then we can infer that if this is the sound these animals can hear, then it's most then it's very likely that, that they're probably producing a sound, a range of sounds that would have been within that range. There's been some interesting pilot study work that was done on um, crocodilians that actually showed that the sinuses in their heads uh, seem to reflect um, or, or seem to help amplify higher pitched sounds um, and that the pitch would have put the higher pitched sounds in the in the uh, range of hearing or would have given them a range of hearing that would fall in line with the sounds that their babies make when they're kids so they can actually hear the little chirping calls from That's the hatchlings right, yeah. so there's some good evidence to show that we can do this reverse engineering uh you just it's the specifics where it gets a problem like we can't say for certain what the frequency of sound was that was produced but we could start doing things like throwing in a range of sounds and seeing what you know, what does a two kilohertz sound sound like versus a 45 kilo, or uh, sorry, a two hertz sound sound like compared to like a 45 hertz sound? And then what does that do in something like the nose, which is usually just there to either amplify sounds um, as a resonator? And it's not usually result, it's not usually used just for producing sound on its own, though there are a couple of animals today that do seem to make sounds directly through their nose. They're all weird-looking animals. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, yeah, this is another point I wanted to um, bring out. You probably would have uh, heard of uh, this um, uh, so-called uh, excuse for a documentary which had the audacity uh, put the real uh, into its title called The Real T-Rex by BBC. None other oh. than, you know, the infamous BBC famous for just basically being completely useless in the modern day and time. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that, that was a bit of a jab there at them. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, yeah, yes. uh, what do you make of their uh, approach to reproducing sound? Because I personally, uh, what I took away from it, I, I thought that they were just way too narrowing it down a bit and just kind of avoided, you know, exploring other possibilities in terms of what range it could produce. They surely taken into account maybe the like gators or crocs, but they only stuck with one specific idea rather than understanding that crocs and gators, they produce a wide variety of sounds as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do think that they uh, downplayed or, or they, they, were made, they were a little too limited in their interpretation 
Um, I like that they were able to look at sounds from, what was it? Was it a dwarf crocodile or dwarf, or maybe a caiman? Can't quite remember. I can't remember myself. It was so long. But they, they were able to compare the sounds of that. And it's, and we run into that issue where it's, okay, this is what, this is what a crocodile, this is a sound that we can get from a crocodile. This is a sound that we get from an emu. These sounds are similar. Therefore, dinosaurs had that sound, which is an approach to using the extent phylogenetic bracket, but it's a bit, a bit wishy-washy in that. Um, again, if I remember right in the documentary, they said that Tyrannus, and I remember there was news reports about it too that that like Tyrannosaurus probably didn't roar, and I'd say okay, I'd say oh yeah, well I mean if it's possible that it it might not have roared but based on the animals they looked at i would have said i would have thrown a caveat because we have because they were looking at crocodilians and there are multiple crocs that do make a roaring sound so you would think that roaring would still be in the repertoire i'd probably say that tyrannosaurus if it roared it probably didn't do do it all that often um just because our understanding of the sensory system of dinosaurs tends to suggest that they were in generally more uh visually oriented animals and they were auditory so i mean there's there it would it wouldn't make the mesozoic a quiet place but they would certainly not have roared as often as they usually do in documentaries but that's more for you know human interest because we like to we like it when dinosaurs and all predators make sounds yeah they have to alert the whole jungle that they are out on a hunt so that everybody has time to hide and we have drama exactly all right. So, uh, is there anything else that you could um, add in terms of commentary or uh, some other interesting conclusions that were achieved uh, in the uh, study that you have conducted before we obviously wrap up the first section and uh, move on to the next section? Right. Right. Um, one of the things that we came across was that uh, dinosaurs, as far as we can tell, probably breathed fairly slowly at rest and did not breathe super often when they were relaxed. Um, this is based on what I had come across when I was preparing the simulation work and that was looking at physiological data that was done on birds and on lizards and on crocodiles. And what continually kept up, kept coming up was that regardless of whether or not you're a crocodile or you're a lizard or you're a bird, Compared to a mammal, you always breathe pretty slowly. And so you don't breathe all that often, and you usually take deeper breaths. And that's probably related to the way in which the, the uh, respiratory system works in birds and crocs, and now that we know in a lot of lizards too, where air just goes one direction through the lungs. Which the upshot to that is that it means that you can get away with having a really long, crazy nose like that without having to deal with breathing through a straw which if you ever try to breathe through a straw, you can feel like it's, it takes a lot of effort to get the air in there. And the longer the straw, the harder it is to do that. And that's a problem that we run into as mammals because we breathe air in, it has to go into our lungs, and it has to go back out through the lungs the same way. So the longer that tube is, the harder it is to switch out that air with clean air. So eventually you would just use up all the oxygen and you'd just be breathing carbon dioxide and pass out. But for birds, we know multiple, like uh, birds of paradise and things like trumpeter swans, they have these really crazy, long, coiled tracheas inside them that would kill a mammal because it's just too long. But for the birds, it's not a problem because every time they're breathing in and out, it's just moving that air through the lung in one direction. So they're always getting a replenishment of oxygen. Uh, crocodiles would be the same thing. We also see they have long airways including a, a longer trachea than we would expect for their size. And then, of course, with the ankylosaurs, we see these crazy long noses there. There'd be the crazy, there's the large noses in sauropods coupled with what would have been an extremely long trachea to get from the head all the way down to the body. All of these things mean you'd have to breathe slow because you couldn't breathe very fast because all that air is going sort of in a line together. So they have to go through at one time, which... Might have something to, which might say something about limitations on activity level. Um, I was going but, to say, yeah, well, like how would that affect their stamina? And that, that's that 
mostly is going to depend on how well the oxygen gets extracted when they're breathing. Because there are physiological uh, cheats that a lot of animals do, when, uh, including ourselves, when, um, when you're under uh, stress during exercise where you can increase the affinity of oxygen distribution in the blood so you can pull oxygen out a little bit better. In the case of birds um, and probably crocodiles, your the uh, the gradient between high oxygen content and low oxygen content is always really high, so it always wants to move into the blood. So it's it's easy to stay uh, well oxygenated without having to breathe rapidly and c continue to change the air out as fast. You can also do things like just take a really deep breath, which is what we see in alligators when we run them on treadmills. They tend not to breathe very. F they they when they're at rest and when they're walking, their breath doesn't change that much, but their the depth of their breath gets a lot deeper as they work harder. So it's another way to sort of offset it. And we'd see the same thing, I suspect, with these dinosaurs where, again, I think I, I, there's a couple of uh, interviews where I mentioned it where like, they're probably not doing a lot of running because they're ankylosaurs. But um, so there's probably not a need for them to have to resort a lot to breathing very fast. But if it did, always do the cheat that we as humans do all the time and then just switch to mouth breathing and just cut that middleman out and just go straight down the tube. If you're a sauropod, you're kind of stuck, but that's fine. Yeah, so this is um, this obviously tells us uh, quite a bit about how maybe they would interact in terms of like predator and prey, whether they would be pursuers, chasers, or uh, stalkers, or ambush, uh, you know, predators as well, if we look at the theropods. So, uh, but well, and that's possibly why we don't see this nose elaboration in theropods, is that there might have been... Uh, and it's hard to say for certain, but you know, one of the things that might have kept that nose elaboration in theropods is the fact that they probably had to be more active than yeah. the herbivores. Also, you know what else I found very um, interesting to uh, look into? You see if um, if they're able to take these deep breaths, yeah, and breathe yeah. less frequently. Does that mean that they were able to potentially spend more time underwater if they needed to? For example, let's say they wanted to dive in to grab something juicy and yummy from the bottom of the you know a uh, river or a lake or something a pond if there's something because there probably might have been some kind of a weed that they might want to munch on and might take them certain time before they can get in there before they have to get that uh, you know another next breath in so do you think that could have uh, been something uh that it could, might have played a role it could it uh it could offer a um an avenue for them to to do to do that uh, the high oxygen re uh, transfer inside the, the lungs could have allowed them because they're breathing less frequently anyway to sort of hold that breath longer for in the case of spinosaurids the si there's some good signs that they were probably doing a lot of aquatic work or semi aquatic work and so they could have been holding their breath a lot longer to go after fish or whatnot um, hard to say for certain one way or another but it, it's it, it does offer an, a good opportunity it is interesting to see you know like today's penguins do just fine with uh, diving down deep even getting away from like fully aquatic birds like penguins you have um like seagulls and uh cormorants that all do this this bit where they like come diving down into the water and they'll, they'll and they'll just go swimming after fish underwater for sometimes a couple of meters or more before they have to go back up to the surface. So they're holding their breath the whole time they're doing that. And it seems to work just fine for them. I've seen ducks actually just diving in and then I count, counted at least maybe, I don't know what, 15 seconds maybe before it would resurface again. So <laughs> that's, that was another interesting one. I just remembered speaking of birds. It is, it is interesting. So I'd say that there, that the fact that you don't breathe that often could offer an opportunity. Uh, sort of offer an opportunity or a, a way to, to do some of this. Uh, it is interesting that there's a lot more semi-aquatic mammals than there are birds, but there's also a lot of semi-aquatic reptiles, and many of them would have that um, unidirectional flow in their lungs as well. So it's probably just because mammals are, they just found a way to make things happen anyway. And for whatever reason, birds didn't get as into being marine probably because a lot of them are just flying all the time so they can just they got their own weird thing going on
Yeah, Evolutionary Bank seems to have a very interesting amount of unexp- unexplained and unexplored reasons w- w- for investing into one thing rather than the other in certain categories when it comes to animals. Yeah, it's that uh, that drunkard's walk or the blind watchmaker approach where it solves it solved a problem. It solved it in its own way. It's not the way we would have done it, but it works. It works, if that's the point, isn't it? So, it's All that matters is that it works. I wanted to ask you as well, of course, uh, what else uh, uh, from uh, all of this that we have covered so far, what else do you think would be uh, a thing to take home for the viewers uh, before we obviously wrap up the part one and get into the some, uh, let's just say, more heated discussions about certain subjects that everybody's <laughs> probably dying to talk about. But we'll we'll leave that for part two. We're not there yet. <laughs> so what, what are your Stay what are your two. thoughts before we wrap up, Jason? What are uh, your the paper? Um, yeah, that the nose in dinosaurs, um, despite being perhaps not the most flashy part of a dinosaur, may have played an an important or, or may have sort of opened up the ability for so many dinosaurs to have gotten as big as they got because they were able to basically keep their brains from overheating as their bodies continually got bigger. I think that is a, a big one. There's some cool anat- There's a lot of cool anatomy uh, that was done in the paper. Uh, we actually sort of reviewed how the palate in ankylosaurus has been uh, traditionally viewed and sort of rearranged and sort of rejiggered that a bit and cleaned it up some so it's more in line with what we see with modern animals um played around with some jargon that doesn't matter as much but uh yeah i'd say that was the big one it's just aside from dinosaurs apparently breathing a lot slower than we usually think is uh that the nose really might have been one of those key that it's expansion the nose really might have been a key factor in just what allowed so many of them to get as big as they were able to get I'm sure one of many factors, but a key factor nonetheless. Yeah, that's uh, one of the cool things that kind of helps us to explain better of how they managed to get so big. And uh, I'm pretty sure there would have been other factors to do with it anyway, but uh, this is definitely one of the contributions that, you know, it's it's basically one of the ways to explain the c- coping mechanisms probably to deal with size. Yeah, you get bigger. I mean, if you get smaller, you have your own problems, but if you get bigger, there's a... There's a, a, a collection of problems that shows up that you have to find a way to deal with, like getting blood to all these parts of the body, getting air to all that, feeding, movement, all these things that change as you put on more mass. Things to keep in mind. Awesome sauce. Well, uh, are we ready to wrap up with this part? And uh, shall we uh, uh, basically look forward to the part two of the uh, uh, session or, or are there more comments that you wanted to add we have all the time you know in terms of how much you want to contribute so we, I th- we're known i think uh you know i think we did a good uh, good uh, summary of the paper and some of the cool things we were able to pull from it uh stay tuned for more cool things that uh, will be coming down the pike soon how, how soon do you think oh, that's always a fun question <laughs> uh, there, there will be something out next year, um, and then other stuff. Next that's, year, next year in yeah. December, or next year more well, like you know. I would hope next year before <laughs> December. So I, I always try to get something out before then if I can. But we're we're starting to do some more of the acoustic stuff, so we should have some interesting stuff to talk about next year, which would be cool. Awesome. Well, in that case, uh, my dear friends. Yep. We will see you in part two. And in the meantime, stay tuned. We'll get some other exciting subjects. And please, link below in the description. Read the paper. Speak soon. <laughs> it's, free to, it's free to read. <laughs> it's free to read, exactly. So read it. <laughs> All right. <laughs>